to uh, welcome Dr. Hoss Sivert. He's uh, been a great friend of uh, CVT and my personal friend for the last several years, eight or 10 years. And I remember uh, our having done uh, complex carotid cases during transmissions from escorts. And once I remember the first time when Hoss was visiting uh, our cath lab, uh, we had to switch over our cath lab for live transmission because the wires, wiring had broken down. So Hoss was bearing with it for uh, nearly 30, 40 minutes, and, but he did not take off his gowns and gloves. And he was, he was so focused uh, on the live transmission. So well, that was because, because your staff was able to change the entire equipment within 15 minutes. Yeah. So, including all the cables and videos and cameras and everything. That was yeah. great. That, that was amazing. And that's, that's how Indians uh, can uh, innovate and uh, really uh, uh, innovate in trying times. So welcome to you, Horst, and uh, you're so famous already for your structural heart meetings, which are global, and then you're teaching a lot of people all over the world. So it's great to have you, despite the fact that you were visiting another hospital today, and uh, welcome to you. Dr. Giza Fontos is a great friend, and uh, he's been with us in the earlier uh, TAVI presentation, and he was with us in the last uh, cardiovascular therapeutics meeting in India, in Delhi, and uh, welcome to you, Giza. And uh, we have a new stalwarts, uh, Dr. Uh, Nagin Bhupati, uh, he's uh, recently returned back from US and is now settled down in, in our country. And he's trained especially in, uh, in structural heart interventions. So uh, Dr. Bhupati, a warm welcome to you. Thank you, sir. And I'm looking for Dr. Ravinder Rao. Uh, I, Dr. Ravinder Rao is, is one of our uh, top uh, TAVI experts and a structural heart expert rather I would say in the country and he's been also along with Sai, he, he's, he's among the leaders who's been proctoring people and spreading the uh, skills of uh, structural heart interventions across the country and both of them are traveling to other countries also in neighboring countries to teach people and share the expertise with them. I can see Dr. Shirish Hiramath. Shirish, hi, uh, welcome to you. So uh, as people join in, I'm waiting for Dr. Uh, Ankur Kalra from New York. Uh, he's also going to be our esteemed expert today. And as soon as he joins, he'll join in our discussions. So uh, with this uh, uh, initial introduction, I'm uh, handing it over to Sai to give his uh, brief about his case for today. And uh, then we will take it from there. Welcome to all of you. We can start recording this, Vikram. Yeah. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm Sai First of all, I should thank Atul for getting us all together in these strange times. It's so lovely uh, and refreshing to see familiar faces. Uh, of all the things Atul has said about me, the one I hold dear is the fact that he said I'm one of his dearest and best friends. Truly honored. And with that, I think I'm going to share my screen and jump right into the case. So can you... Uh, Yes, I, we can see your screen. You can maximize it if you wish. And uh, you're very clear. I will audible also. Excellent. Okay. So today when, when Atul asked me to present the case, I had a couple of choices. Choice one, present something crazy that's happened to me, but then I thought about it. India, majority of the people are still getting the hang of it. So I thought it would be more pertinent if I present the case that I learned something from. And maybe something that, that everybody can go home with saying, okay, this is how we get out of a situation like this. So here goes. The reason why I've said a badly behaved tricuspid is that I'm more than used to bicuspids behaving badly. It's not often a tricuspid behaves badly. There's nothing great about the history of the patient. Um, she's an 80 year old lady, not a diabetic a hypertensive on medication. She presented with worsening dyspnea for the last six months and with syncope and fall. And on evaluation, she had severe aortic uh, stenosis with a mean gradient as high as 97, normal LV. So I don't know if there's going to be much to discuss about the decision for TAVAR with all the data we have now, 80-year-old uh, with severe aortic stenosis. TAVAR should obviously be the first choice, in my opinion. And here is the data sheet, which again is very clear. You can see a perimeter of 86 and a Dirac diameter of 27.6. It's a tricuspid valve. Both these fall in the range of the 34 valve. Uh, as you know, uh, I mean, the femorals are of good size, 7.2, 6.8, 7.0. Mm. The left side, the bifurcation was high, but it was not of any consequence. The coronaries are nice and high, 17.5 and 16. Uh, as we all know that for a 34 valve, we need 31 sinuses. We have 34, 30, and 
So I think it's all good with the coronaries as high as they are. There's nothing uh, to take home from this. And this is the uh, CT images of the iota. You can see a nicely tricuspid valve. You can look at the calcium. The SCJ is slightly small. It's 26 all around for a 34 valve. You can look at it. And one thing that's striking here that I want you to keep your eye on is the elliptical nature of the, of the annulus and the LVOT. The larger, larger diameter is 31 with a minimum diameter of only 22.0. There is a big chunk of calcium, but it does not extend into the LVOT. Uh, these are some images that were generated. I've taken a couple of images. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I want to point out uh, to the image on the left, when you look at the ascending iota, I want you to see that the ascending iota is 28 mm, 29 mm, and 28 mm. So it's about a 28 to 29 mm round. So it's a small ascending iota. You can see the heavy calcium in the images, and I want you to remember this image. Sinus height, nothing great about it. And uh, this is the aortic root. The angle is quite favorable. These are the femorals, fairly straight, nothing to write home about. Right is great for a stick, left is slightly high, but that doesn't matter. These are the images. And at this point, I'd like to stop. And uh, Atul, this is what you want me to do. Atul, could you give me an indication on how long you want me to speak? Because I hate overshooting time. I'd like to. No, it, uh, uh, we, we'll be discussing as uh, we have an hour for ourselves. And sometimes our discussions go beyond an hour also. Okay. Uh, so, so, But please. then uh, if we go too long, then uh, people may uh, get tired. Otherwise, uh, it all depends on you. <laughs> no, no, no worry. Normally, six to seven minutes my presentation. No issues. Oh. So, okay. so basically, before I begin, Dr. Siva, uh, yeah. uh, so, anything, anything remarkable in what you see so far? So uh, can I invite Dr. Sievert uh, to make a comment uh, as to how he looks at this case and what are the challenges he sees? And after that, we'll uh, request Dr. Giza to make his comment. Actually, I don't, see big, I don't see big challenges here. I mean, I'm assuming there will be some, but uh, the, the, it's heavily calcified valve. So the only question I have, would you like to pre-dilate this? Uh, but that's the only the only special thing I, I can see here. So if something goes wrong, that has to be your fault. <laughs> so what are what are the issues which you think have to be kept in mind for uh, people who are beginning uh, when you when you're looking at a bicuspid aortic valve for an intervention? Uh, no, it's the, the, the problem here is the problem here is when when you don't predilate. What I would recommend then. Uh, during deployment, the valve will dive into the left ventricle. So that's the, the issue you have to keep in mind. Right. Can you guys hear Can me? Uh, yes. Okay. So absolutely agree. But before I say anything, Giza? Yes, Giza. Okay. I Could I unmute my system? Can you yes, hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Giza. You're on mute. I completely agree with both of you, Sai and, and Horst. Uh, this looks like a straightforward case, which is difficult to say always and risky to say because the complications are usually coming in, in those situations where you expect it uh, the less. Uh, so I agree completely with, with the femoral exercise. The, the right side is pretty good. And um, I think the real question is, is uh, uh, whether to predilate this uh, pre-VAV -pre or not. Uh, personally, for me, if I had to implant the 34 millimeter valve, I tend to put my threshold a bit lower than with other valves to prepare a bit better um, um, the, the native valve. Because if you start opening the 34 millimeter valve, uh, there's a point when it usually um, <coughs> uh, uh, it's difficult to keep it in place. So it has a tendency to dive deeper in. And when it opens up, it opens up much more uh, pronounced than uh, the smaller ones. So even if you can play with the wire to keep it back to the, the proper um, height of implantation, or uh, you can pre-dilate it. Uh, for me, the, the best way to go is to do both. Pre-dilate if it's calcified and play with the wire to keep the depth of implantation as stable as possible. So Giza, how do you play with the wire uh, when you want to prevent a diving uh, valve? What we do is when we, at, when we start implanting the valve, we start deploying the valve, uh, we push the wire against the apex. 
And if you push the wire against the apex, you can prevent it from diving deeper in the ventricle. So usually what happens when you open the valve, it has a tendency to go deeper by itself. This is the nature of the valve, how it behaves. It goes down like two, three millimeters by itself. And the problem is that if it goes a bit deeper in uh, and you try to pull your catheter back, you will lose your coaxial co alignment of the catheter in the same second. Uh, what we do instead of pulling the catheter is that we push the wire. And if you push the wire, the catheter will move back, the capsule will move back to, uh, to the optimal height of, uh, uh, depth of implantation by while keeping the same coaxial alignment of the catheter. So the trick is that we keep the tension on, on the wire until the point of no recapture, and we try to control the depth of implantation uh, this way. Great. That's the technique uh, used. That's the technique we used in the past with the older version of the Corvaf. But I must say, more recently, we just start. We don't really use this pushing technique anymore. Mm. But we start as high as possible. We start sometimes above the annulus, and then during deployment, the valve dives down. So we try to really hit the annulus with the uh, lower edge of the frame. Yep. Right. Uh, Ravinda, would you like to unmute yourself and then we'll have some questions as to uh, uh, what's your opinion on uh, choice of the valve, which you would prefer in a bicuspid or you can use either? It's a tricuspid, Atul. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Otherwise, everything else. Okay, okay, okay. So, Ravinda, your comments. If yeah, so. Tricuspid uh, valve and uh, otherwise, uh, what is your choice in such cases? How do you choose your valves? <clears throat> So, uh, hello everyone, and I think I'll go straight to it. Uh, so, the recent uh, registry has shown that both the valves work uh, good, balloon expandable as well as a self-expandable valve, both work good in a bicuspid valve, Sapien 3 and Evolute R. Uh, so, this valve is a heavily calcified valve. Uh, I would do a pre-dilatation in this patient. But, you know, I, this looks like a tricuspid, but this can also be a left and right fused bicuspid where the raffe is very small and just present at the base and not extending from mid to distal part of the uh, uh, the uh, commissure. So it's it will behave like a tricuspid valve, but I would definitely do a pre-dilatation to deploy a 34 millimeter evolute R. But you see there is significant amount of aortic regurgitation as well, uh, almost uh, two to three plus AR, which I can see in the aortogram. Uh, but still, you know, I would not hesitate from doing a pre-dilatation. Uh, Dr. Bhupati, uh, we'll have this case. Yeah, this is a tricuspid valve, uh, so and with high gradient, heavily calcified valve. I would 100. Is ACC ACC servicing case hoti hai? I would definitely uh, go with the pre dilate uh, valve. Somebody is yeah. I would yeah, definitely pre dilate the valve considering the mean gradient, whatever Dr. Shoy uh, Sai so told was 97 millimeter of mercury with significant amount of calcium. I've got few concerns about this particular particular patient. Number one, we are deploying a 34 valve in a narrowed LVOT uh, kind of, uh, so the valve may actually jump out uh, into the aorta, number one. Number two, the chunk of calcium sitting at the right and uh, right cusp, we don't know where this chunk of calcium is going to go. Uh, in case uh, we are going to deploy the valve, uh, pre-dilatation, smaller bone, post-dilatation, I'm anticipating a kind of infolding of the valve, considering the 34 millimeter valve in a kind of narrowed space. So uh, during post-dilatation, uh, we, we can have uh, the rupture of aortic annulus, the, because the, if you're going to take a bigger balloon and dilate the, the, the chunk of calcium may move towards the aorta and may injure the uh, aorta. Uh, similarly, as being a 34 valve, I would also like to measure the septal length to exactly know how deep I can deploy. And I would definitely go, in the, go with the um, two cuspid to deploy the valve. The so small that... looks very benign. Uh, I mean, nothing is benign as far as Tavar is concerned. It's, it looks very benign. The only thing is the angulation is uh, quite uh, acute. So in case something happens in the femoral anatomy, getting a uh, Dr. Mathur is here. So, uh, so it will be difficult to, it, it's not an easy straightforward anatomy to do up and over with a large um, cover stent into the femoral artery. We have to go with the seven French large 45 pinnacle sheath. Uh, that, that, may be a, that might be an issue uh, considering the angulation of the aorta with the high bifurcation of the aorta. So does any one of us uh, think that uh, cerebral uh, protection is uh, required in th with this much calcium or this is just a routine calcium which we keep seeing in most of the TAVI cases? Because uh, we are in India, we are still yet to uh, start using cerebral protection, these dedicated devices. So uh, Horst and Giza and Ravinder. 
so because it's not available uh, i don't know but if it is available to me i will definitely use it so uh, how much calcium will prompt you to start worrying uh, for embolization and uh, if if it is available to me i would use it for all the patients all the cases i agree i second uh, ravinder's statement sir i mean uh, most of the strokes what debilitating shows whatever we have observed in patients who have not received uh, uh, cerebral protection device in patient with cerebral protection device uh, we, we still can have a embo- uh, kind of microemboli related stroke but they are all non debilitating stroke so any particular type of valve we prefer when you see a lot of calcium where you see the chance of cerebral embolization would be lesser uh, maybe a uh, edwards or a yeah uh, the question is directed to me i would uh, for this anatomy i would definitely go with the self expanding valve or if available if the risk of this patient is high risk then right. lotus edge might be a, so a suitable valve mechanically expandable valve is a suitable valve for this patient right so uh, with so this yeah so sh- uh, we shall proceed further sai if you are ready uh, you Absolutely. have more questions and you can so, stop whenever you like huh? of course of course so first of all uh, hi ravinda nice to see you half masked uh, but still <laughs> nice to see you uh, so first of all i completely agree with everything all of you have said and i'm not that, normally that agreeable a person uh, completely agree with dr seward the only thing i don't agree with him is that he said this is such a straight forward case if anything goes wrong it's your fault sai that's the only problem i <laughs> <laughs> but but otherwise i agree with everything he said uh for me looking at this valve i i looked at all the raw data myself there was no tiny raphe it was a true tricuspid there was heavy calcium uh decided to go in from the obvious choice which was the right side had a clean area for a stick uh my initial always this is a standard trick thing i use contralateral side puncture first Uh, lima catheter look at it no matter what the ct says take the stick with ultrasound do the root angio you can see the huge chunks of calcium in the root angio and uh, so here's something that i have to say except valve and valves and pure ars i predilect all my cases what i have found is that with predilecting <laughs> even all the tricuspids and everything first of all my post dilatation rate is down to 10% and i able to get the valves higher and my pacemaker rate is almost bottomed out i can't remember the last time i put a pacemaker in the last 100 cases so i pre dilate everything i know it's a very strong statement to make and it's debatable but in in that fashion um, as you can see the valve has been crossed the pigtail is in a nice position i love it when the pigtail takes that nice convex shape the other pigtail is in place that's an 18 balloon we hit it hard with a pre dil and after the 18 predel so there are a couple of techniques you can use when you're trying to get the valve coaxial one of the techniques is what uh, giza mentioned which i like to use as well where i push the wire create tension in the system and move the catheter away from the inner curvature a second one is what i've done in this which i quite like to do which is what dr seva is saying that they do now as you can see i always start the valve at 0 to minus 1 and you can look in the left image the tip of the valve is 0 to minus 1 i don't worry about the coaxiality as i start opening the valve till it reaches the annulus the 34 opens like an alligator so it catches the entire cardiac output especially in a normal heart and tends to bounce up and down and to minimize that you can do two things you can either pace and cut cardiac output or you can do what i'm doing in this image where you can see the wire gently pushed against the lv to stabilize the valve at the depth i like it until i make annular contact now we have to keep in mind that the 34 unlike the other three valves is not tapered parallel it still retains the core valve design is tapered out and it's got a huge tensile force so it does tend to die so it's important to get this part right so once you've used it it's like driving a truck i love the 34 it's one of my favorite valves especially the post gradients are so gratifying because of the huge eoa it gives you so going moving on started at 0 to minus 1 got the valve to make good annular contact and took a quick check shot to see that i was at about 1 mm on the ncc and this is what i quite like to do once i make annular contact i actually move the entire valve while it hinges on the calcium in the ncc and lay the catheter over to get the coaxiality and very gently release the valve and push downward after one of the paddles are released to free the other paddle and i noticed the infold so you can see the infold pointed out even before i started releasing I've noticed the infold even after the valve is done. 
but it's a 34 it's got great radial strength normally what i what i do is at that point of time i don't recapture i've had a couple of infalls and if i just wait 10 minutes it usually opens up the night knoll warms up and opens up so this was the case this is what happened uh, atul i'm not going too fast dr siva is it okay my speed not at, not at all absolutely perfect okay. so, so as you can see exactly as i was anticipating after five to seven minutes of chatting with everybody in the room the info looks much better on the left look at the depth of the valve it's at about two to three mm on the ncc and i'm quite happy with the depth on the lcc you can see the huge chunk of calcium but and i want you to look at where the valve is lying the valve is lying on the outer curvature the, the wire is lying on the outer curvature and i was quite sure i can get this nose cone out because in i've had valves that look more constricted than this where the nose cones come out but if you refer to the image here on the bottom you can see this jagged s shape is where the valve nose cone was stuck and i could not get it out in here and the nose cone was just stuck it was you can see how much tension there is it was actually quite risky to do you have to be very careful when you do this you can see that it is completely pulled to the inner curvature there's so much tension on the wire so there was nothing i could do that could get this nose cone out and you can see how constricted it is in that area after pre dilating well with all my strength with an 18 balloon so this is what you have now after all my maneuvering you can see the valve has moved up to almost zero on the ncc do you agree atul mm -hmm. dr sivat yeah yeah so i tried wiggling it i tried juggling it and i tried waiting another 10 minutes the valve has moved out to zero and remember this is a tricuspid valve and here are my issues you can see the huge chunk of calcium here the valve is at zero and you can see i've corrected the parallax so it's nice and neat and if i pop a 34 out in an ascending iota which is 28 with a 34 pointing outward if i try staring it and moving it it's going to be a big mess so the nose cone is stuck for good i've already moved the valve up 2 3 millimeters by trying everything i can what next valve now at zero at ncc nose cone trap ballooning will surely foreshorten the valve further stj and ascending iota dimensions all spell a disaster for a pop out and it's not even a bicuspid to depend on the supraannular leaflet seal because uh, you have seen several of my cases, Atul, where I've actually dropped the valve even at minus one and bicuspids have accepted it because I'm very confident from the CT data where the seal is going to be. But so, let's case, yeah. so we'll take an opinion from the experts and if, if such a situation arises, what would they do? Horse, I can see you are unmuted. Uh, you, have, you have two options. You can just leave the nose cone where it is forever. <laughs> or the other option is to... <laughs> to insert a second wire from the other axis and do the loading while the nose cone is still in place. Okay. Um, That's shall, I, I shall I go on? Yeah. No, Ravinder? Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I agree with what Dr. Sievert just said. We had a similar situation at Triple uh, M and we reported this in a European Heart Journal. I would just put the wire through that pigtail and you know, not necessarily I'm going to take a big balloon, but I would just take a 23 millimeter balloon to actually open it and leave the remaining to open by its sheer radial strength. Uh, and that way the chances of valve popping out uh, with the post dilatation will be less. But uh, the only solution which comes to my mind is put the wire through the pigtail, upsize the sheet to a 12 French sheet, use a 23 millimeter balloon to dilate the uh, lower inflow of the valve. And the way to do it, you keep 50% of the valve anchored into the uh, LVOT and not really towards the valve side. So the balloon is more towards the ventricular side and definitely the other steps are basic rapid pacing and you know maintain a forward push on the balloon so uh, uh giza do you have something to say or shall i go on i think all of us would do the same wire from the contralateral groin and dilate make some space for uh, the nose cone to come back but what if you have a patient with a bad contralateral femoral this is a question i didn't have a patient uh, which uh, where I couldn't use the contralateral groin, but it can happen that you are not able to go down. There is no access for going down with, uh, with a large sheet for doing a ballooning. I think in, in, in those cases, if you fail with the, this option number one, you can have a plan B of closing the capsule inside of the ventricle. And if you close it inside of the ventricle, there is no step at the proximal edge of um, the nose cone, and you have a much better chance to remove it from the ventricle. But as a plan A, I would also do the same ballooning from the other groin. 
Yeah, so, great. Uh, Dr. Bhupati, you, do you have a point or same? I, I concur with uh, Dr. Ravinder. Uh, right. I would like to go upsize the other groin, do a gentle ballooning with a 22 balloon. I still feel that there is some amount of infolding. Uh, a steep RAO cranial is the suggested view to identify that uh, infolding, which is that opens up the Dr. Ron Waxman's paper in CRT says that that, that open that shows the valve in a uh, in a end on appearance. So we can see the LVOT side of the aortic valve very well. Yes, I we are back to so, you. So I, I I I think both are excellent suggestions. Pretty much there was nothing else left to do. Uh, but I for the benefit of all the all the beginners and all the uh, others who are generally watching this. It's very important you cross the valve exactly how I've shown, because you have to make sure you cross the valve with the pigtail, so you're not through the struts of the valve, because a balloon that's brand new will go through, and if you open it, you'll mangle the valve and mess everything up. So this is how I quite like to do it. I keep a wire inside the pigtail. I gently wait for the bobbing of the heart. I enter the valve clean with the pigtail. I put a, a second uh, confida in, and the one I was, I was systematically recording everything. The one picture that I wanted, my tech didn't record. Where the only thing I'd like to say is where I keep the balloon, where I differ with Ravinder a little. I don't like to keep the balloon deeper into the LVOT because I don't want the balloon pushing that nose cone against the, against the LVOT because it's already quite high up. What I like to do is I like to leave the shoulder of the balloon just at the edge of the valve because my aim is first to get that nose cone out of there just open it enough to get that nose cone out of there. So that's what I like to do. So I leave the balloon at the shoulder, the widest part of the balloon where it starts to taper. Only the taper is inside the LV. I leave the shoulder at the edge of the valve. I took a 22 balloon, Ravinder, your sizing, your logic was absolutely right. I took a 22 balloon. I hit it hard, took it out, moved the balloon slightly higher up, and you can see how gently delivered the nose cone. Now, there's a, there's a trick I kind of use which, prevent, which keeps me more... Uh, secure about the valve not popping out because it's foreshortening because it's so narrow and mangled and it's at zero. So what I do is I float the wire in the mid LV cavity, which you can see the wire is quite high. Once the balloon starts going up, and I'm sure it's up, I push down on the balloon. That's the forward pressure Ravinder was just talking about. I push down on the balloon as I keep going higher up. And this motion actually does two things. It lays the valve over and it prevents it from popping out. Uh, Giza's suggestion on trying to capture the valve, uh, I would do as the ultimate last resort uh, because considering how shallow it is, we have to be very careful with the movement always being from up to down. Uh, even a little bit of push on the side can just tip the valve off the NCC. So this would be the logical first choice. And it's a brilliant suggestion that Giza has said that if you have no other choice, you can do that too. So after the valve was dilated, this is how it looked. Uh, the balloon goes in, on the balloon the wire comes out, and uh, this is the final shot. And you can see how by manipulating the balloon, you can see the coaxiality removed. You can see the valve is slightly even moved down a little. Yeah. So it's actually moved down a millimeter. We got a great result. Um, I got it in trace AR, mean gradient five. And this is how I think, uh, this is what I think would be the best way to handle this. Uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is how I think the best way. Uh, of course, the floor is open for discussion. Great. Congratulations. Very, very good case. Very good demonstration. And perfect result. Thank so, you, Dr. Sivar. So uh, I, I noticed, uh, Sai, that you have been using a, a temporary pacemaker in this patient. Or is it a... It, it's a temporary do you, pacemaker. It's do, you not, pace, do you pace all your patients or uh, selectively in certain situations? I, I pace all my... I'm, I'm, see, uh, Atul, there's a curse and a blessing that comes with being the son of an insurance man. You <laughs> hope for the best, but you always prepare for the worst. Even if my patients have a... So I have, I have done a lot of cases using the wire to pace. That is the confida to pace. Um, but... Sometimes when I need wire manipulation and I need to align the valve, sometimes I float the wire on the inner curvature to tilt the valve more inward. After all that, I just realized I lose space. I always put a TPI in, always. I take it out when they leave the cat lab if everything is favorable, but I always put a TPI in. Even if the patient has a permanent pacemaker atul, I still have a TPI because I've had cases where there's a lag between the signal given and the PPI picking up and pacing. So I always have a TPI, but I don't know what Ravinder and 
what is Ravinder and Giza and Dr. Seward's and Bhupati's opinion, of course. Yeah, Ravindra, uh, your opinion on pacing in a self-expanding stint deployment. Congratulations, I great case and uh, perfect implantation can't get better than this. Congrats again. Uh, I agree with his steps. We would leave a pacemaker for 24 hours in a patient who has who is at high risk of acquiring a complete heart block, like patients who have baseline RBB, base, patients who have baseline prolonged first degree heart block and LBB, and patients in whom the membrane length of membrane septum is small and the valve is deeper than the length of membrane septum. But if patient has narrow QRS, high implantation, large LVOT, no change in ECG from baseline, we would remove it on the table. But this is not the recommendation from the you know, company or IFU. It is safer to keep pacemaker for 24 hours in patients who require a self-expanding valve. Right. Horst, anything else? on? Yeah, we, we, we uh, also paste all these patients, with the exception of those who have a permanent pacemaker in place, then we do not add a temporary pacemaker. But uh, we are using uh, the pacemaker lead of a permanent pacemaker and attach this to a non-sterile pacemaker outside of the skin. And that gives us the opportunity to monitor the patient if needed for several days and pace them as needed. And with that, the patient can be mobilized uh, actually on the same day, can walk around, can go to the normal ward. And uh, so the pacemaker is screwed in like a permanent pacemaker lead. And then we can decide from day to day how many days we give it in. And by, by doing so, our pacemaker lead is now also very low, maybe 5%, something like that. So that's a technique you may, may consider. Excellent. That's, that's excellent. Good. Interesting. Giza? Uh, in our center, when we first reviewed our data, that was after like three, 400 procedures, we realized that uh, the major source of tamponade was uh, the temporary pacemaker which meant out of the first three or 400, I can't remember now, it was after three or four, but we had seven tamponades. All of the seven tamponades were the consequence of the TPI. So after that, we, we started to use um, uh, the confido wire uh, for, for the temporary pacing. And we always put a juggler line in the patient for anesthesia. So if it's needed, and if you feel that uh, the pacing is not stable, then, then we put a balloon tip pacemaker, temporary pacemaker in the right ventricle, but always um, a balloon tip pacemaker. But um, if uh, the test works well with pacing through the confida, we use that even for ballooning and also for backup. After procedure, we remove, of course, the confida wire. And if there is no conduction disturbance, we just go up uh, with the patient to the ICU. Uh, with, with a juggler line there if we need something. If we feel that the patient has uh, uh, any conduction disturbance right after procedure, we put a temporary line and we go back to the ICU with the TPI in the patient. Um, the pacing works very well uh, through the wire with the confida, with the normal um, uh, on wire or even with the safari wire it's much less reliable with the Lunderquist wire. So if you need the Lunderquist wire for, for the procedure, then, then we put uh, up front um, the, the TPI in. Uh, is, is a late coronary access uh, a challenge in one type of a valve versus the other type of a valve? Uh, what is your experience in, uh, in such cases? Uh, Giza and then Horst and Ravinder? I Sometimes. could not hear your question. Can you repeat? Uh, so it's sometimes you need to go back and check your coronaries after a year or two. So do you, yeah. uh, do you feel that you're more comfortable with the balloon expandable wire uh, stent uh, valve or uh, self-expanding valve? Not really, not really, not really. I mean, uh, we never had a case where we could not do angiography or PCI after core valve. And uh, it's sometimes a little tricky to go through the starts, but uh, the same can actually happen with the, with the AdWords valve. And what is important, for, for our routine PCIs, we always use for the left coronary the EBU4 catheter or EBU catheter, guiding catheter, whereas after TAVA, we use the regular JR4. So that's the, the only difference. Right. Lisa, your oh, no, off, off late, more and more, if you look at where the C marker is, it's facing you. 
So the commissional alignment, I, I try my best to get it as well aligned as possible. I mean, some cases you can't, but most often I like to get it like this, where you know that you're not across the tabs and you're clean and you have a good pathway. And you'll always be able to find a way to get it, in my opinion. So I can <laughs> spend two minutes on uh, how to do commercial alignment. And that's, uh, that's uh, talked about quite a lot nowadays. Uh, I'm, I'm not how do you go about doing it? So I'm not good. So this is where uh, I have a little opinion. I have an opinion that's completely different from what everybody is talking about right now, where they want to do. So I was talking about commissional alignment. I think you're asking me about cuspal alignment, Atul. Yes, for coronary access. Hmm? So. Uh, commissional alignment for coronary access, what I like to do is very simple. With the core valve itself expanding, it's self-centering. I don't think you can truly align the commissures. But a good way to try to do it is, is to keep the hat marker either on the left side or the right side. Because if the hat marker faces you flat, you're going to end up with the C tab or the com on the coronaries. If the hat marker is on the left, then you end up with the C tab facing you like this and you have the highest chance of getting a good commercial alignment. So most often the valve will have its mind of its own because the human anatomy is not same for each. But sometimes if it will allow me, I like to take it back down, turn it, both of us hold it in place, go back in, see if I can get it where I want to and open it. Dr. Seward, Giza, Ravinda, what do you think? I, I quite agree with you. I think with the current generation of devices, uh, having a commercial alignment is not easy. Basically, the catheter does what it wants to do. You can always try to rotate the catheter, but it's not 100% predictable. I would say it's not predictable at all. Of course, <laughs> we are happy if we end up with a good uh, alignment um, of the commissures, but uh, if we see that the commissure is out of the ideal position, we just drop the valve if the depth of implantation is good. And then um, we don't really know what are the consequences. For coronary access, I think it's not that important. Uh, our feeling is that we can go through uh, the struts anywhere. The problematic part is that if we have a low coronary ostium, so we, with the self-expanding valve, uh, the 13 millimeter of the inflow part is covered. So it means that the coronary is, comes from below that level then you, can, you have to go out of the struts and find your way uh, inside of the sinus of the coronaries. It can be tricky sometimes. For that, you can take, um, take time and you can take Jatkins catheter. Sometimes you, you need to find your way in the coronary uh, with the coronary wire first, and then you can try to go down uh, with the guide extension to have a good alignment to the ostium. Sometimes it's tricky, sometimes it takes time, but uh, I can't remember any case which we couldn't finish up because the valve was in. Uh, Dr. Ravinder, any uh, yeah, so any I, thoughts I, on yours? Yeah. Yeah. Your in approach? India, we don't have too much of experience of uh, uh, engaging the coronaries uh, after the tower just because of the sheer numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just going to share some of my experiences. I use the guideliner in all the cases. So I would use a uh, EBU 3 or a Jetkins 3.5, undersize my guide, use a wire, balloon, and a guideliner, and completed the PCI through the guideliner. Uh, theoretical wise, I think a lot of things have been discussed. There are papers written about tower align, but you know, it's all theory. Um, uh, but guideliner is really helpful. So we haven't had a problem in actually engaging a car. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mathur, I would like to add a few points yeah. uh, in yes, addition yes. to whatever yes. that has been told. Uh, as Dr. Stewart uh, told, Dr. Stewart told that it's not uh, it's not easy to I mean, it's very easy to engage the coronaries for a person like uh, Dr. Stewart. It's easy. It's highly tricky. Uh, uh, we cannot compare Dr. Stewart's skills like uh, uh, possibly one of the best interventions in the world. So it's highly tricky to engage a coronary after tower. Number one, in our experience, the, the paper published in Jack and Circle Interventions intervention clearly says that uh, engaging coronaries is uh, easier after balloon expandable valve with a shorter frame. Number one, number second point, number three, uh, we uh, out of 300 plus odd cases, we attempted in uh, to have commercial alignment. We have been successful in getting the commercial alignment in 80, 80 to 80 percent of the cases. We have got um, post CT done in 100 odd cases. The paper has been published in the International Journal of Cardiology. Uh, but we would like to keep the flesh port at three o'clock position. Keeping the flesh port at the three o'clock position uh, gets the hat marker predominantly on the greater curvature. Once the hat marker is going to be on the greater curvature, the C port most likely will lie between the right and left coronary. This is the, this is the uh, original uh, uh, concept by Dr. Gilbert Tang. 
uh, consistently we are we have been able to do it if you are not able to get the hat marker on the greater curvature in 5% of the cases we have we are used to manipulate if it is not on the greater curvature in the iota we used to pull it back to the descending thoracic aorta and rotate the entire system so that we can get the hat marker on the greater curvature uh, and then go and uh, deploy the valve again and uh, regarding pacemaker we would like to pace all the patients uh, irrespective of the nature of the valve it gives adequate control for deployment unless the patient is going to have a very severe lv uh, we would like to pace if, even if it's going to be a lv function of 20 25% and we would like to keep a mean pressure of something around 60 at least 60 65 if not 50 uh, to deploy the valve though it's only different schools of thought and uh, there's a paper there's an app available in both ios and android how to engage coronaries after tower from mount sinai it's a highly useful uh, app that they give step by step Whenever we encounter difficulty in engaging either right or left, one catheter which definitely helps us in engaging is the Ikari right. It can engage, it will be helpful to engage both right and left because it has got a long primary curve. It definitely helps in engaging both right and left. Excellent points. So there are a couple of questions if I can pick up from the audience and uh, throw it up to you. So uh, one question is from Dr. Vijay Kumar and he's asking, should we do a pre-dilatation in all tricuspid valves which are heavily calcified or not? And uh, so uh, first of all, comments on this question and then another question from Dr. Hazra. Mm -hmm. So anybody of you experts would like to take it up? Dr. Ravinder is unmuted. Visa. So the question was about pre-dilatation of all the patients who have tricuspid calcified aortic stenosis. Uh, not really. We cannot generalize it. It depends on the valve which you are choosing. So if you are choosing a balloon expandable valve, the idea to do pre-dilatation is to help your valve uh, to cross the tight orifice and a position at the annular plane. So in majority of balloon expandable valve like a Sapien 3, you can easily cross the valve without doing a pre-dilatation. So it is not only the uh, calcium uh, which helps you to decide about pre-dilatation, it is also about the angle. How bad is the angle from the ascending aorta? Will your crossing be easier or not? So the pre-dilatation for a balloon expandable valve is just to make your valve enter into the orifice. For a self-expandable valve, remember, if you want to implant your valve as high as possible, you don't want to do a post-dilatation, as Sai had pointed out. And then if your mean gradients are very high, very critical aortic stenosis, heavily calcified valve, bicuspid aortic valve, it is better to do a pre-dilatation with a smaller balloon and then implant your valve. So it is, it is not a generalized statement, uh, Dr. Mathur. It's, it can vary from uh, patient to patient and also from the valve which is being selected. So there's another question from Dr. Hazra. Uh, he's asking what will be the role of interatrial shunting in case of a residual left ventricular gradient and LV dysfunction post tower and the consequences of the shunt or the aortic gradient on the pre-existing interatrial shunt. So these are two issues. So, uh, Horst, would you like to take this? Uh, interatrial I mean, shunting? We, we, we never had a case where we put an interatrial shunt after, after a tower. But uh, in principle, whenever you have uh, a patient uh, left atrial pressure and low right atrial pressure, then the shunt may be of some benefit. But I, I think this is not specifically linked to the situation after tower. Right. Uh, so, uh, Sai, you had uh, some more slides, and you had some uh, I can, short. I, can show I, I thought. I'll, I thought since uh, Dr. Sivert and uh, Giza are here with Ravinder, I thought I'd show a fun case. Yeah, I'm sure. just going to go sure. past it in a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. that's why I hashtagged it. Never have I ever. The host has disabled my sharing rights. They didn't like my tips and tricks on coronary oh, access. I, I don't know how it happened. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to request that. No uh, problem. Can you can you share again? Uh, Yep, I'm back. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, wrong presentation. Okay. Okay, it's working now. Perfect. So, uh, this is a real fun case, and and Dr. Sivert, I'm knowing you, you will be amused. <laughs> okay. So. I want you to just keep looking at this AL1 catheter. So this was a challenging case. It was a bicuspid, heavy calcium. The CRM was not very good. I started the case at 11.30 in the night and I could not cross the valve with any catheter. Finally, I took a, I think I took an AL1, the only AL1 or AL2 they had there. And just keep looking at the arrow. 
And look at the Candida breakaway. Just keep watching it. So I've entered the LV. I'm not doing anything. I'm not pulling. I'm not twisting. I'm not doing anything. I take the wire out and just watch it break away. Did you see that? No. You'll have to run it again. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to play. Just watch it's it. It's clearly, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just watch it. So let me see. So can you see the catheter floating around on top there? Uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So the damn thing just spontaneously broke off. And I'm wondering what the hell did I do? And the next thing you know, I go in, snare it. And as I start pulling it down, just watch it break off. I, very gently. I've not even tightened the snare. Okay, do you see that break? The, it looks, it's almost, and can you see the catheter flying down on the opposite side? Just where the arrow is? A piece of it. So the, the go, what I'm trying to show is that it kept breaking like powder. Oh, very oh. fragile. Eh? This must be a new catheter, not re-sterilized, because it could not prove that it really works. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you what I, I had no. So anyway, kept breaking into pieces each time I held it. Then I had to think, what the hell do I do? I took the long sheet out because I wanted to occlude the right iliac and use the left, left iliac as the only funnel. So I pulled the long sheet out to use the sheet to fit the iliac, cut flow in the right iliac, made all the pieces come out bit by bit into the left iliac, went and fished out all the pieces, sucked them into the catheter as you can see. Can you see it? Mm. Yeah. Yep. And took all the pieces out and including the small ones. It's my OCD to find the tiny ones. Went ahead, crossed it again, uh, did the tava, uh, did the ballooning, and the iliac was fine. Everything was fine. I finished the case at 1.30 in the morning, and um, I couldn't understand why the catheter would break like that. So what they had done... <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, the valves didn't break into pieces. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they had done, Dr. Siebert? I was proctoring this case and they had left the catheter stock behind the server and the heat oh. from the server had baked the catheter. Yes. So even though it was not a new catheter, even though it was not an Oxford catheter, an old catheter, it was a new catheter, but it, was, it felt okay to touch it, but the minute it hit the blood, it just kept powdering off. So this was not um, a freshly baked catheter. It was, I, uh, think it's, I don't know what it was, but uh, never have I ever seen that. Yeah, see what? unusual. So what behind the server or did they have more catheters there? Uh, I don't know. I ran out of there like a bat out of hell. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, uh, it reminds all of us that you know, we got to be careful where we store our stuff. Then. That's important. <laughs> That's interesting. Very nice. Unusual. Oh, Nobody no, can say anything. We've never case. seen such a thing. Yeah. That was a fun case for me. Anything fun. else? Giza? Do you have, uh, what is this stitching a vessel then? Is this? Uh, a stitching a vessel, it's, it's all complicated. Before we close. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, five per closes, one side. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you can see the two holes. One is one centimeter below, one is one centimeter above. Yeah. So what actually happens is that, so this was another proctored case of mine. I did the first stick deployed the first per close and gave it for the second per close. And you know, the per close has got a soft junction. And if you don't know what you're doing, it can bend and buckle over the vessel. You know what I'm talking about, right, Dr. Sivar? The soft yeah. part can come out and bend. And if you push it too much, you can actually rent the vessel. That's what happened with the second per close. The incision was rented. There was torrential bleeding. Now I have two choices. A, I can take a chance and put a bigger sheet in. But God forbid the 14, I don't know how big the rent is. God forbid the 14 doesn't seal. It's a real shit show. Uh, so what I did was I had one per close in place. So the first thing I did is the wire was bent like a Z. So I took a dilator, carefully moved it in over the bent mangled wire, took the wire out with compression above, put a nice stiff wire inside, took the dilator out, tightened the knot on my first per close first. 
once my first per close was nice and tight, I moved the second per close to a couple of millimeters below, deployed a second per close, tightened it out, took a third per close, pushed it all the way to the bottom of the incision, tightened the third per close, then took a stick one centimeter over, of course, after checking to see how hemostasis was, and finished the tab art and used two per closes for that. And this is the final shot. So this was uh, the three per closes lower down, and that was the two per close X on the top. I don't even know if I can reproduce it, but it worked. Yeah, that was quite brave. <laughs> yeah. I think I think this this buckling of the wire uh, especially can happen if, for whatever reason, during the puncture, you are changing the direction of the needle. The coaxiality, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and the best way to overcome this is what you did to use a dilator where we could solve the problem really only with a four French dilator because this one was the only one which went over this buckled wire into the yeah. exchange for a stiff wire. That's, that's the next step then. Yeah, very important. Such problems usually happen if you're using a Teremo wire because they, they buckle easily. Uh, so just to show you the buckling, I just thought I'd show you the buckling. This is what happens with the buckling. And I thought the audience would like to see how it buckles. Look at that. I actually flew out a buckling to teach. It was very controlled. I didn't rent the vessel. Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how it buckles. Yeah. So it's very important to be careful when you're handling these. That's the things. junction of the stiff and the soft portion. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. anyway. Excellent. Very well recorded. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to add one point. Whenever this uh, obese patient happens, it's not uncommon in uh, Western countries. So we used to ask the second operator to help us in pulling the belly all the way up towards the patient head side. This actually gets the uh, device, per, per close device, a little easier as compared to uh, keeping the belly all the way uh, towards the foot. Uh, Ravita, what would you like to say? Yeah. Uh, no, I agree. Sometimes, you know, what I do, I do these over uh, exchange length uh, step wire. Yeah to begin with. So if my patient is obese, I will deploy my, uh, so I will take a puncture, put a six French sheet, put a stiff wire, then do a nice dilatation of the tract. And then I would deploy the proglide over a stiff wire. Yeah, mm -hmm. this thing happens. It's a soft wire which causes the problem. You know? This buckling will happen mm -hmm. only then. Excellent. So if, if, uh, if, are there any more comments from our experts? And I'm looking at the questions. So more, most of them have been answered. And uh, it's been a great uh, presentation by you, Dr. Sai. And uh, we've, we've had a good discussion generated. And the experts, of course, you know, they are masters in this field. And they've, they've done hundreds of such cases. And it was really a great pleasure to have all of you spare your uh, valuable one hour for us. Because there are a lot of people who, have, uh, who are beginners and who are also doing a lot of cases. So all these discussions, uh, we take away a lot of uh, learnings for ourselves. And same applies to me. I'm also learning from all these. And I would like to extend a heartiest thanks to all of you for joining in today. And we would look forward to connecting with you and learning more from each of you in future, whenever the opportunity arises. Thank you so much. And bye-bye to all of you for today. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Thank you so much, thank you. for having me over. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Siva, Giza, Ravinda. It was such fun just Thank meeting you. all of you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ravinder, Dr. Sivert, Dr. Dr. Giza, and Sai, of course. Thanks, all of you.